not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. <clears throat> Here then is the bread, which is the body of Christ given for us. Eat it in remembrance of Christ. Christ's blood shed for us, represented by the, the cup that Christ has established for us in this ordinance of his church. Drink it in remembrance of Christ. The scripture reading is from the um, third chapter of Ezekiel, and as you will you will see as we proceed into the sermon this morning that how this relates directly to what we're going to be uh, talking about theme in, in in God's word. So let's begin at verse one, Ezekiel chapter three, verse one. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find there. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely I sent you to such, if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they're not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I've made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they're a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you Receive in your heart and hear with your ears and go to the exiles, to your people, and speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear. Then the Spirit lifted me up and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from its place. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them, and the sound of a great earthquake. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles at Tel Aviv, who were dwelling by the Shavar Canal. And I sat where they were dwelling, and I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. At the end of, this, of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. 
Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked man from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live. Because he took warning, and you will have delivered your soul. And the hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Arise, go out into the valley, and there I will speak with you. So I arose and went out into the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory that I had seen by the Shabar Canal, and I fell on my face. But the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and he spoke with me and said to me, Go shut yourself within your house. And you, O son of man, behold, cords will be placed upon you. You shall be bound with them, so that you cannot go out among the people. And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth, so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who will hear... Let him hear, and he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. And that is the word of the Lord. You see there in Ezekiel what you see in most all of the uh, Old Testament prophets, saw in John the Baptist. They were actually, you might say, the word of God in person and coming. And, and so you see there the word of God being just tied, shut, uh, that's it. You won't have the Word of God, so you won't be able to have the Word of God, you see. And uh, we'll be looking at that kind of thing further as we move along. Let's ask the Lord's blessing then on the ministry of His Word. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You for the, the Scriptures that are Your written Word that You've given to us, and in particular, we thank you for the living word, the, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and dwelt among us and, and now is in us. We thank you, Father, that uh, in him, in Christ, our eyes and ears have been opened, that we might hear your word and see it, understand it, and that we might have hearts that love your word and are, and are willing and ready to obey it and believe it. And so, Father, we pray that that would be the result as we, as you're, we hear your word uh, again this morning. And we pray that you, uh, you would teach us and increase our faith, increase our understanding in the knowledge of your will. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, yes, I've been studying a bit uh, a background of the Old Testament prophets as I've been getting ready to begin our series in the, in the book of, of Jeremiah. And uh, Jeremiah, I think, is one of, one of my heroes in the Bible uh, and probably, probably my, uh, I, I like Jeremiah, I can really identify with Jeremiah a, a lot and, and I really appreciate that. Book and, and I hope that you will too. But this morning I've got a little bit more preparation to do uh, before we begin. And besides, uh, uh, before we begin Jeremiah, and besides there's a few points that, subjects that I think are very, very, I know they're very, very important to us that kind of keep recurring, at least as I've talked with people through the week and, and then I study God's word and you see that's the very thing we were just talking about. This is a, 
this is something we need to be very much aware of. And so uh, what I wanted to do this morning is show you three ways that uh, our enemy is always using to work to undermine our faith in Christ and, and, to, and to deceive us. None of these, I, I, I don't think any of these are going to be uh, new to you, but it's good for us to be reminded. And also, I think that if, we're, if we are honest, uh, many of the things that we've heard repeatedly or read repeatedly in Scripture, and we get to a point where we think that, oh yes, I, I understand that. Well, maybe we don't quite understand it uh, uh, as well as we really as we really need to. So what we're doing this morning is really kind of uh, taking Peter's words to heed, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And I think that we are, even as Christians, we're more vulnerable to his um, um, devouring uh, tactics than we realize, and, and uh, especially when we become overconfident. You know, oh yeah, yeah, the devil, yeah, he's, he's prowling around, all, all right, you know, he's going to uh, get hold of those foolish people over, over there. But, but he's always making, uh, trying to, to make shipwreck of our faith and one good thing about the devil he he keeps using the same tactics all, all the time well they work for him right and uh, but but on the same token we can learn those tactics from scripture and be wise to them our, ourselves and so here's three points that i think is important for us to look at together this morning first of all and this, this first one should be like a no-brainer to us, right? Sometimes, as I said though, some of those things that we think are, oh, well, yeah, that's obvious, might not be quite so obvious as we realize. So, first of all, Satan sends false shepherds among us to deceive us, okay? Satan sends false shepherds among us to deceive us. That's the first one. Secondly, Satan and his followers mock God's word. This is a common, common tactic. Satan and his followers mock God's word. And third, and maybe this one you might not have thought about that much, and yet it happens all the time, and the enemy uses it. It's actually a characteristic or a trait that I think is found in all of us, and, and Satan likes to capitalize on it. And we can state it this way. We are prone all right, there's a bent in us. We are prone to believe an evil, and I, should, I would insert false, an evil, false report about a righteous person. We are prone to believe an evil, false report about a righteous person. And at the same time, here's the irony of it, we are prone to disbelieve an evil, true report about a wicked person, okay? And, I, and so I, I want us to see how that plays itself out and how much damage that, that, uh, that does. Favorite tactic of the enemy to, to use that. So let's begin with the first one, all right? Okay, Satan sends false shepherds among us to deceive us. Now, we think we know that, but at the same time, the Bible, and we're going to see it repeatedly in Jeremiah. This is a huge theme in Jeremiah. But, but the Bible repeats this over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, right? False prophets, false teachers. I mean, basically almost the book of, for example, in the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Galatian churches. Wouldn't If you took all the warnings about false teachers out of Galatians, what would you have left? Not, not much. You see, it's really kind of the theme of, of the whole thing and a, a, false, a false teachers and a false gospel. So there's large, large spaces in the Bible that uh, deal with this warning. Obviously, we need to hear it over and over again. We need to be remi reminded of it, you see. Now... <clears throat> To examine this, this point, this tactic of the enemy sending false teachers among, among God's people, 
Listen to the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, but here, it's like, kind of like the opposite because what he's doing, what Paul is doing here, is he, he's giving a, bib, a, a description of a true shepherd. A, a description of a true shepherd. And you can, you know, you can expand this, not just to, to apply, we're discussing false versus true pastors and, and, and church leaders and so on, but church members, Christians then, right, as well. These kind of characteristics should uh, characterize every genuine child of God. So listen to Paul now as he gives uh, a description of the opposite of a false shepherd, okay? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, when, when he came to Corinth, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of, in, in the power of God. Jeremiah, as we are going to see, was, you might say, we might put it this way, a member of the clergy of his day. He was, it opens right up in chapter 1, saying that Jeremiah, when he was called by, by the Lord, lived among the priests. He was a priest in a town called Anatoth, just close to J Jerusalem. And, um, and he suffered a lot because he was called by God to confront his fellow clergy, false teachers that really... He was a, basically about the only faithful, faithful one left. And his own family as well. And they hated him. And all of them tried to kill him. They, they persecuted him and, and so forth. Now, we are not wise. We are very foolish if we think that Satan is not going to pull the same things on us, on us today. If you've ever tried to confront, for example, the clergy... Right with then then uh, um, if you've ever tried to do that, you probably experienced to a degree what uh, what we've experienced as well, what Jer Jeremiah experienced. You know, we've done it and we've had to do this in several cases in several denominations and these people who are of repute and so on in these organizations. Never once did they listen. In fact, they said, "Hey, you don't belong here." Just get out. You know, that, that, was their, that was their response. And that's somewhat of what Jeremiah then um, experienced. And that shows us the mark of false, of false shepherds. But what we have here, these verses are crucial. Well, because what we have here given to us by the Apostle Paul, by the Lord through the Apostle Paul, is God's appointed philosophy, philosophy and method of Christian ministry, okay? Now, you would think if that was the case, if somebody could say to you, hey, you know, does the Bible tell us anywhere how the church is to function and how the leaders in the church are, what they're to be like and, and how they're, to, oh yeah, yeah, it does. It says it very plainly. First Corinthians chapter two, verses one through five. Well, you would think everybody you know, in, in the seminaries and so forth, that we're going to have required course. We're going to look at biblical philosophy of ministry. The text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I can tell you, without exaggeration from firsthand experience, that was never taught once in the, sem in the years that I, that I was in seminary. Oh, yeah, we went through, we went through 1 Corinthians... But no one ever, no professor or anyone ever, ever said, stop. Do you, all you people, all you students, do you realize what we've just read? This is God's way uh, of, of ministry. 
This is how you are required by God. This is the kind of person you're to be. This is how you are to minister. They never did. What we did have in regard to leadership in the church was, guess what? When all of you guys, every one of you, go to the library or anywhere you want, Amazon, pick out a book on anybody who seemed to be a great leader and read that book and then tell us what you learned, right? Tell us what you learned about leadership so that you can be a good leader in the church. <laughs> you go to the world to learn about leadership and then you're going to, well, that's how it is to be done, you see, in, in the church. What is happening? The focus is upon our own talents and abilities, upon human greatness and strength. Paul is taking, and this is the Apostle Paul, listen to him again, listen carefully. I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I didn't come that way. I didn't come like some academic philosopher. I'm going to, you know, I was, uh, by the way, I was looking at a, a commentary this week on Jeremiah. And certain of these aspects of academia, I understand, may, may have their place. But when you go through the uh, bibliography, for example, of what this uh, uh, PhD was the, who wrote the book was listing. He, he listed all the references and so forth. And you go down through them. It's hard for me to describe. They're, they are academia. They are so that you know when you read this commentary, you are going to be reading things like you'll come to this paragraph and, and you're looking at this passage in Jeremiah and then it'll say, you know now, Schwartz or whoever, over in Germany in the 1800s, he wrote this about this verse, and that was his insight. And then you have this other guy over here, and he, you know, he had his insight, and we don't agree with that. And then, and, and they're just looking at these minutia, and you have like page after page of this bibliography that the, these guys are looking at, and, um, and, and this is what Paul, I think this is what part, at least part of what Paul is saying here. I didn't come to you talking about Christ like that. I didn't come to you preaching the gospel and, and studying you know, the, all the nuances of what this person says and that person says. In fact, I think what Paul told Timothy is he said, you know, Timothy, there's a lot of guys who among the Jews there that are, you know, they're, they're speculating about this and they're speculating about that. They don't know what they're talking about. You need to make them shut up. I mean, that's what, that was his instruction then to, uh, to Timothy. And so, and Paul rejects that. He, he rejects it. He, he um, um, instead says, look, I took care that when I preached the gospel to you, I didn't present myself as some um, degree, you know, I had all of these degrees and so on. He only under reluctance does he talk about that in, in Philippians. But, but, uh, but he, he, he says, I, I came to you uh, not in plausible words of wisdom, plausible words of wisdom, you know, words that would, oh, the, the academics and so forth would just, would just eat up. He said, look, we have to be, we have to handle the word of God in fear and trembling because he holds us accountable for presenting it to his people accurately as he wants it Presented, and we should be fearful, and we should tremble that we that we might not, not might not do that. And we must have an attitude of weakness and insufficiency in ourselves. Why? Because there's always, always, always a danger that um, 
we will try to sell the gospel in the power of our own words, impress the people so much so that then they will believe. But the problem, Paul says, if that happens, their faith is not genuine faith. It, 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 their faith is resting on the wisdom of men, but not on the power of God. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the real thing. That's why you'll find in the Bible, uh, well, Paul says this again, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. See, but if I'm strong, I'm kind of boastful and I'm taking, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, then what happens is I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I, I've neutralized the power of God. The Spirit of God is not going to be working. And, I, I, and in light of all of those things and this passage, let me ask you this question. Which of those two methodologies is typically being followed in the churches today? For example, if somebody, and I, I don't, I didn't write this sermon as some kind of an apology because we don't have very many people here, okay? Particularly we, this Sunday, I mean, people keep hurting themselves or whatever. Stop falling, everybody, right? Uh, but uh, but <clears throat> I wrote it to, I, I wanted to deal with this thing. It, it's very encouraging, and I want you to find it um, in, encouraging as, as well. If we're not careful, in our stupidity and unbelief and foolishness, we start thinking that God's power is measured in human terms. In other words, that if we are going to do God's work, if we're going to do God's work, then we've got to round up a lot of people. We've got to round up a lot of money. Isn't that the nature of what supposedly is Christian ministry today? It, 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 large, it largely is. If you got, well, you, you can't, I can remember not, oh, yes, it's been years ago now, but a guy used to be in this church and, and, uh, and, and moved away, but he came back and visited one Sunday and we didn't have all that many people here. And he said, hey, you guys got to do something. You got to get something going. You got to get something going. And, and what is he implying? He is implying that, that we've got to be strong. We've got to have all these people. And, and in other words, or, or we can't. We're not going to be able to do anything for the Lord. That's, isn't that totally uh, opposite of what, of what Scripture uh, what scripture says. And that's what Paul is, is trying to get across here. Our faith, we want people's faith to be produced by God, not by us. And that's really the heart of it, isn't it? You know, we, we don't, we can't, you can't produce faith. You can't get, you can't make somebody a Christian. They have to be, they have to be born from above. And I, 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 confidently say that most of the so-called faith that's embraced by professing Christians today is false because it rests on the wisdom and power of man and is not a product of, of the powerful working of God by his spirit. In other words, most people who claim to be Christians are traveling on Broadway. They're traveling on Broadway. And very few, of course, then find the, the narrow way that leads, that leads to life. How does Satan use this? He promotes it. He promotes this kind of thinking in our minds so that we end up measuring greatness and power according to the, um, the world's terms, you see. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that as, um, as well. Do you remember the account back in... Uh, Judges about Gideon and uh, Gideon and his people were being oppressed by the Midianites. And, and Gideon, by no means in and of himself, was any kind of a, of a hero. I mean, he had his moments of, of bravery and so on, but then it's like he just wanted everybody to hush this up so nobody knew that he was, he was the one uh, that did it. And 
But the Lord was calling on him to lead the people out against the Midianites. And, and the Lord told Gideon, you've got too many people in your army. There's, there's too many of them. And you know, you know the account and how they went up and some guys drank water one way and the others drank, you know, and send, send them home. So the Gideon ends up with a really very small number of about 300 people. And the, Lord, the Lord's reasoning was this. He told Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, above me, saying, my own hand has done this. My own hand has done this. I really believe, I confidently believe that the Lord purposely thinned out the ranks in this church so that he could begin to work, do his work through us. I have, I have no doubt about that. And if you can think back through how he has worked in this church, you will find, you can't miss the fact that as he whittled down the numbers, his work began to just happen. Right? It's not the work necessarily that we would have imagined, or we, but, 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 uh, but it did, and and it's it is all it, it's all his doing. You go to uh, look at the letters to the churches in Revelation. Say you're a Christian, and. Uh, Maybe not a real wise Christian, but say you're a Christian. You move to a new town. And so you're going to look for a church to go to, right? And, uh, and what, if, what if the churches in that particular town happened to have seven churches in there? And they were all characterized like the seven churches that, are, that John writes to in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, right? And so you pop in and you visit Smyrna. And you look at this and you think, man, these guys, they're pretty well hated around here in this community. And, and uh, there's not very many of them. This is a weak place. I'm not too impressed. Next Sunday, you pop over to Laodicea Church. Now, you know, this, this is where it's happening. Man, these guys, they got, they got numbers, they got money, they got... I mean, is that God's evaluation of those churches? Of course not. Of course not. He detests... Laodicea, and he encourages uh, Smyrna and tells them that, um, that in their poverty and their, their, their weakness, they are rich, you see, as, um, then as, a, as a result. Satan works to get our thinking all turned around on this matter. You can write a book about this theme in the Bible, right? D those passages... How about throw in then the verses on the last shall be first and the first last, right? See, over and over and over again, we, uh, we have it. But, and we think we understand these things. Okay, yeah, I understand that. We, why, that's a song that we sing. You know, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Got it down. No, we don't have it down. And you can, you can see that we don't, we don't have it down when we forget that <clears throat> God's work, well, let's put it this way, salvation is of the Lord. It isn't of us. Salvation is, is of the Lord. More and more and more, I'm, I'm, I think, seeing more and more clearly and absolutely convinced Salvation is of the Lord. If people are going to be saved, God's got to save them. Everybody. And people, you know, they'll say, oh, oh, it's absolutely true. Well, how come we don't act like that? How come the churches don't act like that? How come, how come it's got to be, um, um, we're going to have this, this great event. I mean, this is going to be a biggie. And we're going to have thousands of people there and, and, and we're going to, and here's our list of speakers. Look at all these speakers and you all know their names. You know, these are the big ones and they're going to come and speak. And we're just going to see, we're going to see God do this great work. He doesn't work that way. He doesn't do that. And we, we need to, we need to understand that. You see, 
Um, there's point number one. Understand, when we're weak, then we are strong. And, and it, it will be typically the Lord's work. You know, we thought, last year at this time, maybe we thought, we were, well, he, he's got his whittled down pretty good now. You know, and then, uh, uh, but he has a way of making us see our weakness more and more and more. And if that's what it takes, Paul says, I'm content. I am content. We would rather have this thorn in the flesh removed, but Lord, if it keeps me humble and makes it so that when I'm weak, then I'm strong because you are working, then, then so be it. And so be it. The second point we want to look at here that's vital for us to understand is that Satan and his followers mock God's word. Now here again, we say, yeah, they absolutely do. Well, we know that. We know Satan and, Satan and his, his minions, they mock God's word. But this tactic can sneak up on you and bite you if you don't really have it down and really understand it. And I hope I can explain that to you. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 31, where we have this. Paul says this repeatedly, okay? For the word of the cross, the gospel, is folly. That means foolishness, stupid, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to, the, to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Oftentimes I think back <clears throat> about Berlin and myself and how from each of our families, we're the only Christians in, in either family. And we think about that. I think about that. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> how, how did that happen? I mean, I know it wasn't because I was such a great kid. Or anything. It couldn't have been that. But here's the answer. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. That's the only answer to that question. He chose us. He chose us and, and grabbed, uh, and grabbed a, 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 hold, a hold of us. But this section here in 1 Corinthians 1 uh, Paul talks about this matter of the world's wisdom in contrast to, the, to uh, God's wisdom. And they're exactly opposite of, of, of one, from, one, from one another. Why is this important for us to understand? I think back to my years in college, and many of you can do the same thing. And uh, Phoebe's in college now, right? So this is something to be, really be on guard for. When I was in college, I was no, by no means a mature Christian, but I, I did have a genuine faith in Christ, and I knew that the Bible was, was God's Word. But what happens in college, and it happened to me, um, though I, I wasn't wise enough really to spot it at the time, but, 
but uh, is that you, you go to college and, and you get exposed, sometimes every day, in the classroom to some of the most evil people on the planet. Um, academics can be the most evil, evil people on, uh, on the planet that you'll run, that you'll run into. I had an English professor and it's, oh, and I, in fact, I told Jessica because she, she went to the same college in Monmouth, but, uh, you know, you drive down the main drag of the university, now it's a university, and look over and you pass this one building, I guess it's a humanities building or whatever, it's called like Bellamy Hall. I think it's Bellamy Hall, right? Okay. Bellamy, Dr. Bellamy was a wicked man. I know because I had him. Uh, classes. I, I had him in, for English classes. And, and he mocked Christ. He mocked the Bible. He mocked God's Word. One, one time in, uh, in class, um, he, he had posed some kind of a mocking question or, or whatever. And I raised my hand and I, and I said, well, the Bible says this. That's why we shouldn't do that. And he just started laughing, this mocking, mocking laugh. And, uh, yeah, he's a real hero, all right. Bunch of college freshmen here, you know. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Well, anyway, um, sometimes I think I should just go back and enroll in college then and give him a hard time, you know. But, but um, here he was, you know. So I had him. I had a history professor that mocked the Lord. What's that got to do with history, by the way, right? I had science professors that, that did the... Some of, the, some of the same things. And so they would mock God and they would mock anyone who was, who was a Christian. We need to be wise and understand according to what Paul is talking about here. Philosophers and the wisdom of this world. That one of the most evil places that you're going to ever run across is in academia. In, in, the, in, the, in the universities. There's some Christians there. But you know as well as I do that if somebody, they're not even necessarily a Christian, but if they even let, it, let word get out to their fac fellow faculty that they believe that possibly there's some credence to the idea of intelligent design in regard, you're gone, that's it, man. You, you, are, you, are, you, are, done. you are done here. But the university can be the, one of the most uh, uh, evil places that, it typically mocks Christ and mocks Christ's people. It reminds me of, uh, I think it was Charles Hodge in the old Princeton seminary days. He was young and he went over to uh, Germany to study theology and Hebrew, maybe, I think it was. And one of the older faculty members uh, wrote to him and said, Charles, when you're there, remember the air that you breathe is poison." And you better, you better remember that, that uh, it isn't just in the universe, but certainly it is, it is, it, you're breathing poison air there. The word of the cross is foolishness to the, to the wise of this world. They are perishing, <laughs> right? We're the ones, we're being saved by, by the power of God, but they're perishing, but they want to take you down with them. And then they can do it in such a subtle, uh, such a subtle way. For example, um, let's take the science classes. Uh, in some ways, maybe some of the safest spot would be the mathematics classes. But if some guy wants to bring in uh, atheistic ideas about uh, math, I guess I guess you you could find it there as well. Uh, incidentally, I think one of the things we're going to find when we're with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. If you like mathematics, this is gonna be a great place. Whatever you like, you know, is mathematics because you know where mathematics come from? It's the order and design of the creator. He's, he is the mathematician and, and uh, it, part of the things we're going to be amazed at is how everything works out. All the formulas in creation Work, uh, work out. But uh, certainly in science, in academia, we, we find 
uh, a field where, you know, what a mockery. They don't get past Genesis 1. Genesis 1, here it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. God created the heavens and the earth. Ah, right. And so there, the atheistic uh, philosophy, evolutionary th philosophy is so ingrained in the sciences that, for example, if you study, let's say, study botany, zoology, uh, biology, what, whatever, any of those fields, let's say, let's use botany as an example. <clears throat> you know what taxonomy is? Taxonomy is the system by which we, uh, science, names things, genus and species and orders and families and classes and all, all that sort of a thing, all right? All of those things, all of those, all of those categories are designed around the, the theory of evolution, for instance. So if, if you pull, this is one reason that, that these kind of people are so threatened by any idea that evolution is false is because their whole system is coming down. If, I mean, they're going to have to rework all kinds of things. For example, in botany, uh, botanists will talk about the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. The gymnosperms are the conifer, cone-bearing, evergreen-type trees, okay? The angiosperms are uh, flowering plants. So you've got those two categories, and what they'll explain to you is that part of the reason is those categories are there, you know, that the angiosperms, the flowering plants, are more evolutionary advanced than the gymnosperms, okay? And so all that, the whole e evolution just, just percolates through everything, you see. Think of geology. Remove evolution from geology and you wouldn't have a textbook left, right? And you know, I, I mean, I, I got a degree in biology and, and when I graduated, I still didn't, I did not have a clear picture at all, uh, for example, about the, uh, the geological ages, so-called geological ages, you know, Mesozoic and all that stuff. I still don't. But what I didn't realize until much later is, you know what? None of my professors understood it either. You couldn't, you, if you went in and talked to the science professors about, can you like, explain this sequence of geologic ages so that I can, can figure this out. Even if you got one that proposed it, if you go to the next one, it, 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 it's gonna be different. And I realized those guys don't understand it either. And the reason they don't understand it is it's, it's phony. It's the, 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 thing is, the thing is false, you see. But why do they cling to it? Because they won't have God. And as a result, <clears throat> the enemy then mocks God's word. Now the university is I picked on the university here, and they need to be they need to be picked on. It's a dangerous place to be. Um, but uh, think of Hollywood or the business world or any part of of the world. You see, and they will use mockery. In God's word to what? To try to stamp out the gospel. See, that's what those professors were doing when I, when I was in college. They're trying to stamp out. If there are any of you students out there that have any seed of faith in this Jesus nonsense, we're going to put an end to it right here. And they use mockery then uh, to do it, you see. You need to be called on the carpet, by the way, because when you sign up for an English class, say English literature or something, you should be studying English. I, I don't care what this professor has to say about, you know, I really don't care about his religious views. I don't care. That's not what he is supposed to be teaching, but they use it as a, as, as a, a seedbed to destroy the faith then of, of young people. <clears throat> And then finally, let's look at this last tactic. So I, I should say, recognize the mockery for what it is. And actually, maybe not in every case, I think an effective way to deal with a mocker 
is to throw it right back at them. I mean, I, I finally started doing that with uh, <clears throat> somebody that was always bringing this kind of a thing up and, and mocking Christianity and, and pushing evolution. And finally, I just, I just said, you know what? Are you really stupid enough to believe that stuff? And it surprised me. They shut up. You know, they finally did. But anyway, that might be one way to, to handle it. But recognize it for what it is. They're mocking They're trying to destroy your faith. And then third, here's this matter. It's rather ironic, but it is absolutely true. We have to watch out for it in ourselves. We are prone to believe an evil, false report about a righteous person. And we are prone to disbelieve an evil, true report about a wicked person. And I don't know about how the psychology of this thing works, but I know that the enemy will try to, he uses this all the time, and we've got to be on our toes about it. Here's an example. John 8, you are of your, Jesus telling the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now look at this last line here. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Isn't this interesting? When we're told the truth, and in, in this case, the truth about what some wicked person's been doing, right? Our tendency is to disbelieve it. And when we're told a lie about a righteous person, our, our tendency is to believe that. And we need to be on guard um, against this. I see this all the time, multiple times every week, and I'm sure that many of you have seen it then um, uh, as well. We're going to see it played out all the time in the book of, of, of Jeremiah. A false report about a righteous person tends to be believed by people. A true report about a wicked person tends to be rejected. Here's some other examples from Scripture. 2 Corinthians 10, their enemies are going after Paul. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. And Paul knows that the danger here is that the Corinthians are going to believe this. It's a false report about a righteous person, the Apostle Paul, and yet they're, they're prone to believe it, you see. And again, in 2 Corinthians 11, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I'm not, the, not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, which he wasn't, but they're claiming that he was, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we've made this plain to you in all things. Did I commit a sin? in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Why does he say that? Because these super apostles, these phonies, false apostles, were saying, well, look, he doesn't even charge you anything. His message isn't, you know, it's all these false accusations, and, uh, and they're, the Corinthians are believing it. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. Galatians 4. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They, these were these wicked false teachers, they make much of you, but for no good purpose, flattery. They want to shut you out from Christ that you may make much of them. It's always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I'm present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, 
I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Why are you believing these guys? Why? You see. Well, this is something that the, the enemy does. Satan is very deceptive. He can be very smooth. His, his uh, representatives, emissaries, can appear as, as sons of righteousness, right? Because he can appear as angels, angels of light. Um, the tactic was used against Christ himself. False accusations, and yet they were willingly then um, embraced. And as I said, I don't pretend to fully understand the psychology behind this. It probably has to do with that fallen flesh that we're still in. But it's absolutely true. There is a tendency in us to believe a false, evil report made against a righteous person and to disbelieve a true report about the wickedness of a wicked person. Right? Oh, I just, I, I couldn't believe. He seems like such a godly man. I just couldn't believe that about him. But that same person will turn right around and believe uh, uh, a, a wicked lie about some normal person, some lesser type person, you see. Here's a wolf in sheep's clothing, been hiding in the church for years as a pious saint. That's his disguise. All along, turns out he's been committing some secret great evil one of his victims steps forward what's going to happen you know what's going to happen when it's all settled out he's going to be still sitting in the pew embraced as a wonderful man that we're all going to forgive and the victim is going to be gone and criticized for telling all of these false reports about them this is how the enemy works and, and we're, we're foolish if we don't understand this and, uh, and, and realize it. Paul to the Galatians again, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if, if you accept circumcision as false teaching, works righteousness, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, false gospel, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Now look, here's, here's what happens. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. And that is what evil is always trying to do. Always trying to do. Sever us, distance us from Christ. Distance us, us from his grace. And from, his, and from his salvation. I was reading a, a blog article this last week by a guy that uh, his father was a pastor for many years, and it turned out that he molested numbers of children in churches. And uh, it's, it's a long story, but this man has taken this ministry on himself now to expose the, this, this kind of a thing. And he said, he said to Christians and to pastors in this article that he wrote, he said, when a report, an evil report, a, a report of wickedness, comes to you from somebody who says they've been victimized by this, you need to step back, be wise, you need to step back and distance yourself from this person, from the, the alleged evildoer, even if that person be your best buddy. You must step back and you must be objective here and you must look, you must look at the case and you must not say, oh, that can't be. You, you're, you're sinning by saying something like, uh, against a, a, a person like that, you see. And yet that's the norm. That's what seems to happen then all the time. So we may not be able to change the thinking in all the churches here, but we can change how we think and how we understand this. That realize that in you, there is this, this bent that we have to be on guard against 
that we will end up, if we're not careful, becoming an ally of the evil person and an adversary of the innocent. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of your word, and we pray that you would um, really help us to remember these tactics of the enemy and how he sends false shepherds among us and and how they glorify themselves in ways that we can identify them and sort out the true from the false. And how we can stand against the enemy's mocking of Christ and, and us and anyone who walks with Christ. And, and how we need to be wise when evil is discovered then among us. And Father, we, we ask your forgiveness for the many times that we have we have failed in this regard and we have not been wise. We pray that you would change that in every one of us for your glory and honor. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to uh, close the service by singing.